All right. I think we are official. You should be able to stop sharing your screen then, Terry M. All right, did it leave? Mm hmm. All right. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure what you all have talked about in the past in this group. So, it, you know, if you don't mind, you know, just giving me, a, you know, a thumbnail sketch of some of the ideas that you've already come up with or what you've thought about in terms of this bucket or if you've even had that conversation. <laughs> I think we talked about vaccine hesitancy last time. <laughs> Yeah, That's we were <laughs> we were just kind of freewheeling. It seemed like That's hilarious. I love it. It happens. No worries. So this one is a little narrower than uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, I'm looking for the sheet again. So it is a lack of mental health service providers for young people, a lack of culturally competent mental health service providers, prevention for sexual exploitation, public safety, which seemed to take into consideration a lot of individual items around public safety uh, things like speed limits biker safety uh, domestic violence and then also air quality when i look at this list i mean i'll just be very honest my uh, and I, this is coming from my profession i'm an occupational therapist and um, teach occupational therapy um, have worked a lot in the mental health realm, but um, it's very frustrating to be in a profession that um, is limited to only working with people in a mental health capacity in under the medical model, um, under like acute psychiatry, where we're just absorbed into the cost, um, or under Medicare, when the rules in this state around who can be a qualified mental health provider are written in such a way that it is very difficult for anybody else to really directly provide those services without it being linked to something else. And so when I think of youth, there's a tremendous amount of youth who receive OT services through the public schools, but those therapists are so strapped, they can't even they can't even begin to touch mental health stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet there's therapists in the community who would love to be doing more, partnering with more community organizations. And I have capstone students actually doing this uh, through my, my main job as a professor. And it and we also have a capstone student who's working uh, at the state level of DHS around proposing some language changes to expand some access. So, because it wouldn't just be us, it'd be like pharmacists. There's like three or four of the professions that the, the languaging in the state law is that you have to be able to diagnose. You cannot be a mental health provider unless you can diagnose. And that is, that's not true in every state. There's many states that don't have that language in it. And there's a much broader array of people who are working boots on the ground in mental health and not waiting for acute illness. So, so that from my own professional background, that is just, Every time I hear, oh, there's such a shortage of mental health providers, there's like so many of us that are like, we're here, it's just the rules are making it impossible. Um, so anyway, that's my beef on that. <laughs> and, that and that sounds like something that would need to be addressed at the state level. It is, it is totally, yes. Yep, it absolutely you is. And that is know. where we're, we're taking it, um, yeah, for sure. But you know, it's all connected to this other stuff, right? It's all connected to sexual, you know, exploitation prevention and domestic violence and all kinds of stuff. 
Yeah, I well, do you have anybody helping you kind of wordsmith the the proposal for yeah, the legislature? Yeah, I, I have a student uh, who did a whole capstone on it. We have a whole committee. We have a lobbyist. So we're yes, we're in process. Okay. But these things, as you know, take several legislative sessions often, right? Sure. You know, we're at the we we have the language actually drafted and now we're at the um shopping it around stage not to legislators but to other people in the community so that you know to make sure everybody understands what's going on and and not um push back against it if we were to bring it farther along yeah um, that, and that might not be something for this committee but that's no, something not, if not. you want to you know i'd be willing to assist with that i have experience with um Great. You know, health, health policy and and you know looking at proposed legislation so yeah i will um for sure connect you with the, the group that's doing this um yeah so anyway that i know we're this is not really the purview of the public health you know public health advisory board but um and you know obviously like you said it's two different levels but it that's just the thing that jumps out at me like what what can we do even at our level to influence well, I think, yeah, I, I I would like to offer a couple of things because this is a topic of discussion in the Community Health Improvement Partnership of Hennepin County. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, that partnership is specific to Hennepin County, but it includes the five health boards that are in Hennepin County, so Minneapolis, Bloomington, Edina, Richfield, and Hennepin County, uh, health plans. Uh, one of their priorities is community mental well being. And so we've got mental health, you know, providers in that group. And so this topic has come up in a number of different ways within that partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think that there would be a way for the Public Health Advisory Committee to, if nothing else, write some sort of, I don't know if it would be a letter of support, if it would be a, a letter to the city council, maybe timing it out with like May is mental health month or timing it out well, September would have been like suicide prevention month. Right. Mm -hmm. it, but, it, you know, actually utilizing, you know, what is already kind of a recognized, um, yeah, or recognition, you know, that mental health needs more attention and to write something, you know, that says this, and our appeal would really be to the city council, but, you know, it would be something that we could get the health department behind. We could, you know, potentially, you know, get the CHIP community mental well-being group behind. Um, I would love if the health department, when we get to the point at the state with these groups that are coming together to say, let's, because we're not actually changing the language of QMHP. What they're proposing is this another category that's kind of parallel without the diagnostic thing. And boy, would I love in two years to have the the the, the um, uh, public health, you know, what do you call it, public health department on board saying we support this because we mm -hmm. need more boots on the ground. And, and maybe yeah, if you absolutely. compared it, you know, just to throw an idea out there, maybe if you compared it to, you know, nurse practitioners and physician physician licensing, kind of how that whole. I think that is kind of one of the strategies they're doing is looking at all the the different ways these things work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. I like that idea, Margaret. Yeah, and you know, there is, um, I, I mean, there's so much discussion that happens in that community mental well-being uh, group because they also talk about the lack of culturally, mm -hmm. um, you know, well-matched culturally appropriate, you know, providers, language appropriate providers, um, you know, where, um, one of the, so I'll just give you some background. One of the um, organizations that we were able to provide some funding to is actually working on trauma within the Latinx community. 
and how they are dealing with it is that, of course, you can't call them mental health providers. You can't, you know, or anything like that. But they are working on training people in trauma, in being trauma informed and um, holding healing circles mm -hmm. that are in the languages, you know, spoken by the people that are being trained. And then, you know, those healing circles are, you know, then have a ripple effect, you know, because then more people, you know, get exposed to, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of discussions, which is in and of itself, mm -hmm. mental health work, you know, community mental well being yeah. work. Um, but these are just, you know, people that are, you know, a part of a closed, um, kind of church community. And so, you know, the church is able to, and this organization is able to do that because they are the mental health provider. So they're providing the training to the, uh, to the community members, hosting the healing circle groups. And then each of those people are being invited basically to have their own healing circle groups or to take, you know, to take sort of that model and do other things with it. So I think you're right, Terry, is that it's like there is, there is such a need and there is just so little uh, available to people, you know, and, and there's this grand scale of need and then just so little, you know, in terms of uh, the narrow uh, definitions that are out there of who can actually do this work. And it's so, you know, the impact just ripples all the way up when you hear, I, I just talked to a cousin of mine not very long ago. I wouldn't talk to her about once a year and she uh, has bipolar and I hadn't heard from her in a couple of years actually. And I reached out to her. So what's going on? She had a, she had to be hospitalized and she had to go way up to like, way north of here like seven hours north to get an acute hospital bed oh my gosh you know because there was nothing in the twin cities and she lives in the metro and there was absolutely no beds here at all and what that makes me think is how do we deconstruct that and spiral that back right how do mm -hmm. we go if we had more people boots on the ground at the community level right outside of the medical model who who could say I'm a mental health provider, I work in the community, you know, it's not about triaging medical stuff, it's really about health and wellness. How could we stem that tide? I mean, we still need more resources at the acute medical level too, so I'm yes. not ignoring that. But what could we do way back here that would stop someone from spiraling out of control and then having the trauma of having to be transported, you know, wait seven hours north from any community that they're familiar with just to get a bed at a Sanford hospital? You know, right. I mean, it's it's all so tied together in terms of the resources. Absolutely. Erin, um, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, get get a word in edgewise here, because, uh, again, I, I want to um, piggyback on something that you just said, Terri Ann. But I, Aaron, I, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to share your thoughts the too. nailing going on in my dining room right above me. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like they're hanging pictures or putting on a door or something. We we place hardwood floors in our dining room and oh. now the trim work is going on. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of pounding for all of that. So so I don't really have too much to add. I mean, my uh, professional background is obviously attorney, so I, I don't have the same um, uh, level of insight into what's needed at the at the mental health um, practitioner level and the needs of the mm. community like Terry Ann does. Um, you know, my potential role in being able to assist with all this is is assisting with drafting uh, lobbying proposals and, and evaluating mm. proposed mm. legislation to make sure that there's no, um, you know, quirky language in there. It's it's funny mm -hmm. how I mean, I spent most of my day to day um, correcting what I would say is a legal mistake that someone made on a trust modification from 2002. If I had done that a different, you know, it, it, it we're correcting it, but it should have been done. It, sh it should have just had this phrase, one phrase written differently would have saved us, you know, a significant amount of work. So um, wow. 
yeah, so people key in on that type of stuff, and especially, mm -hmm. um, you know, a divided legislature is going right. to uh, chew the fat, uh, it, like you said, in more than one session. So, you know, that's that's sort of my role is to kind of sit back and, and see where I can help. And um, if there's an opportunity to get involved, that's something I'm, I'm interested in. So. Cool. Well, I'll tell you another thing that um, the city health department is involved in, and that is a, so besides CHIP, which is focused on Hennepin County, we are part of a collaboration that is seven county metro wide called the Center for Community Health. And the Center for Community Health also has a mental health uh, mm -hmm. collective action committee. So I sit on that committee as well. And um, I have seen CHIP and CCH, I have seen their, their circles, you know, their circles of conversation coming closer and closer and closer together. And finally, like in the last, I don't know, two years, you know, actually creating kind of their own Venn diagram, you know, where the sweet spot is, how do we increase community capacity for responding to mental health concerns in our neighbors, in our children, in our grocery stores, at the bus stop in the libraries, you know, and one of those things is by, uh, you know, taking the same model that CPR has, you know, CPR was all about increasing community capacity to be able to respond in emergency to a cardiac event. AED training, same thing. How do you train, you know, the common person to have some skill they don't have to diagnose mm -hmm. they don't have to give meds but if you increase the capacity within you know the common person walking down the street to recognize to ask questions so to margaret we have point the mental to resources health. you know i mean that the that is a response aid, the mental health first aid training that's what this is right yeah that's kind of what you're yeah. talking about. is that open yeah. to anybody in the public yep but we don't yeah. really promote it or it's people probably the word the minute they hear mental health they think oh that's not my area right right and even you know to piggyback on what margaret's saying even with the the police you know my, my mother was talking about an opportunity or a, a time that she was on um uh, a, a grand jury and uh, there was an elderly gentleman who had dementia and um, you know was acting out violently I mean he, it, no one was in danger of getting real hurt or anything I mean he, you know possibly some simple assaults or something but you know that was my mom's first question to the police officer during uh, during the uh, grand jury was, you know, was he oriented to time, place, and uh, date? You know, is, is this person even capable of understanding where they are at the moment? And, you know, that doesn't even, that does, I don't think police are even trained to do that, let alone the person on the street. Yeah. Well, right. No, which, that's that's yeah. definitely, you know, true. Now, Now, what I can tell you about mental health first aid is that um cch as an organization you know for years had worked on uh decreasing stigma mm -hmm. you know because that's another huge thing right as you said terry ann as soon as you say mental health people are like i'm out of here you know i'm going the other way um because i don't know what to do um and, and so reducing stigma and uh i would love to do a presentation on this to the phac it, it, they developed a model called the zone of um, the zone of mental health stability. Mm -hmm. And how do you keep people in that zone? Or if they go outside of the zone, what are the tools again that you as a, you know, a common person have at your fingertips to help bring somebody back into that zone or to refer out, you know, and of course that's that's part of the problem that we're talking about is that if you refer out, who are you referring to? Because if you right. have 
such a squeeze. But at the same time, if I as a, a, a you know, just a common individual have some tools in my tool belt to at least engage in conversation, ask questions, you know, maybe just be able to sort of pull that person back from the edge and bring them back into their zone of mental health stability, that is enough to get them through, you know, until there is potentially, you know, uh, a somebody, you know, for them to be referred to. I like that idea. You know, I'm thinking of several years ago, um, a neighbor of ours called the COPE program. You, you put, oh, yes. You forget what the acronym stands for. Yeah. Um, but it's basically, you can call anytime and say, I have someone who's having a mental health crisis. Well, basically, because the person she was calling about didn't have a diagnosis already, COPE wouldn't do anything. Sorry, uh. can't help. You know, this is for people that we already know have mental health. <laughs> it's, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that was great. <laughs> I'm the one who told her to call them. And then she's like, yeah, they were no help whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think you're right. I like the idea of how do we teach people, you know, signs to look for that are not symptomology, but just like, hey, when, you know, how do you say hi to somebody in a way that just says, I care about you without, like in right. you know necessarily opening up a whole conversation there's just so many little things that people can do you know right um, yeah, yeah i think it would be helpful you know even you know with this as a chosen um you know priority area and honestly mental health has been at the top for PHAC for years. And we really haven't done that much about it because we've had these other big things that we were working on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, maybe the time is right because we just had that fantastic um, presentation from Meredith and her uh, yeah. coworker from Hennepin County. Uh, you know, we could definitely have, you know, a presentation on the zone of mental health stability. We could have a presentation on, you know, some from somebody that's doing the work in Hennepin County on, you know, the community mental well-being team. Um, and just to get a lay of the land, you know, of like what is happening at the city level, at the county level in this, uh, you know, other uh, realm, you know, and then to um, figure out, you know, OK, so now we've learned, you know, a number of different things about mental health actions that are actually going on, you know, right around us. What's the role for PHAC in that? You know, um, what can we do? To piggyback off that, so, you know, we have an election coming up with a ballot measure on it in Minneapolis about reshaping the police department, right, and changing yeah. it to um, the Department of Public Safety. And, you know, and so as I understand it, not getting rid of the police, obviously, like all the rhetoric says, but really just expanding and making sure the right people at the right time to respond, which is like what we're talking about. And my question is, and I have no idea because I have really been so busy at my job, I have not paid any attention to, to like polling numbers or anything. So I have no idea the reality of whether that ballot measure could even pass or not. But if it did, what is the role of, let's just say it did, and suddenly like we are going to reimagine public safety. What would the role of this committee be mm. in having a voice in that outcome that is a million dollar question yeah that is a really great well, question if it doesn't even if that ballot measure doesn't pass what is our role with the minneapolis police department which i know is probably a stretch but you yeah. know what i'm saying in terms of okay so let's say that measure doesn't pass but it's clear that we've got to do something different around um how we approach some of these things which are often directly connected to mental health or cr creating pushing people into mental health out of their zone mm -hmm. right and what is our what is our role and you know city to agency to agency in the same city right right yeah aaron i see your bubble lighting up oh i sorry i was just breathing hard <laughs> <laughs> you were like that, yes yes no my my uh, well i i do think it's a good idea i mean i i have thought that the intersection of you know criminal defense and public safety uh, you know policing so to speak uh broadly 
broadly construed and public health needed has needed reform. I've been aware of that for a long, long time. I mean, it's it, it occurs in the jails, too. I mean, as, as long as you want to go right down that road, um, you know, when you talk about the lack of, um, you know, care for those individuals is significant. I mean, most of the people that are in and out of the criminal justice system are suffering from either uh, addiction or mental health or, or both, or have experienced some sort of trauma in their life. I mean, well, there, there's an anecdotal saying that the largest provider of mental health um, treat or mental health services is the jails right now. It, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's, I am certain oh, that is the case. So true for so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, really getting the, you know, I think the awareness is starting to get out there with the public, but they don't, you know, I, I've had my foot in the criminal defense world at times and really became aware of it through that avenue of realizing just how poor mental health services in the United States are. And oh, yeah. so... So, yeah, I mean, there needs to, I talk, am 100% in agreement with you that there, that uh, public health should have input into policing and, and specifically with mental health. And, you know, I would throw addiction treatment in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know if that's technically considered uh, a mental health disorder or how it's exactly diagnosed anymore, but ultimately, um, you know, there's not enough services for those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. But I think your question is really a good one, Terry Ann, is that it's like, yeah, what is the role for the Public Health Advisory Committee in relation to, you know, these critical conversations that are going on around public safety and yeah, is there a way for us to be able to, well, which is probably why it ended up in the same, you know, bucket, is that it's like to to pair, you know, that idea of public safety and mental health and, you know, and and then what can we advise, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's really or recommend or, right, um, or do, you know, even. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we always and want to get a little, a little <laughs> careful about right. you know um, what we're asked to do because is it within our purview? You know, because right. that's one of the things. You know, is that it, it gets a little tricky if you're asked for you know to deliver the moon and it's like okay, well, you know, we're not you know rocket scientists, so we can't really do that. Um, yeah, but I, I do think that it's a very legitimate question to ask and uh, to at least try to uncover or discover, you know, is wh where do we fit? Do we fit? And where do we fit? And how do we fit? Yeah, Aaron, I'm sorry. I no, you're good. I mean, open. they just, you know, they could sell those MRAPs that they were putting up and down Lindale Avenue last year, mine-resistant uh, armored personnel carrier MRAP. Mm. Uh, you know, it's like they don't need Army equipment, in, in my opinion. It, mm -hmm. That would be better spent towards mental health services and but Amen. um you know I, I i agree with you it's just you, exactly where do we fit in and and how do you get a slice of the pie and just um mm -hmm. you know i don't know has anybody ever budgeted out what you know different proposals like what they would cost or anything like that to that extent yet or no boy i don't have any idea what i can tell you is that the you know minneapolis health department of course has a whole office of violence prevention mm -hmm. and i know that they are involved anyway in some way you know in these conversations so again maybe maybe it's reaching out to you know that division and asking them to i don't know you know imagine with us to you know provide some 
you know, some depth of understanding that we clearly don't have, you know, in this moment. Yeah. yeah and, and maybe I'm getting too, too many steps ahead, but I mean, ultimately by the time it lands on, you know, uh, city council or a governor or legislature's desk they i mean those are the nuts and bolts that they're going to say okay what's mm -hmm. what exactly are you proposing how much is it going to cost right. yes yeah yeah i haven't you know i missed the mayoral debate the other night that happened um the one over zoom and I, like I said, I haven't really been other. I mean, I know what the issues are, but I haven't done a deep dive research myself. But I, 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 even if our job as a, an advisory board was to dispel some of the myths to the public, right? I, I get we're an advisory board. So we, we, uh, it's like I used to say to my kids when they were teenagers, you know, they'd be like, so and so, why did they do this? And they can't do this. And I'd be like, I can't make anybody do anything, right? That was constantly my refrain as a, as a parent. I can't make anybody do anything. And I, I kind of feel that way about this board too, right? Like at any advisory board, like sometimes they don't even want our advisement. <laughs> we offer it anyway, which is good. But I do think, you know, what, how, how can we, how can we put the press so it comes from the community too? Is that our role? You know, and I, I mean, it just ties everything together that we've already been talking about, right? You know, what can the community do even at their boots on the ground level, you know, in terms of interacting mm -hmm. interpersonally? But I just think, how can we, is there a role for the Public Health Advisory Committee to help shape the local conversation on, well, what does it mean to have less police officers and more social workers? What does that really mean, right? right. You know, um, and you know, in Minneapolis, the truth is we're hemorrhaging police officers anyway. We already got less officers, <laughs> so sure. Let's fill them with some social workers. Do do um, they have? Do does the the police department keep data on how many of their calls are mental health crisis or anything like that? Uh, I'm sure that they do. Or yeah, because I maybe, but yeah, maybe, even if the department doesn't. Yeah, because yeah, there would be either three one one or nine one one that would keep all kinds of data, you know, on what sort of calls come in, um, you know, response time, you know. I mean, there's like all kinds of data, you know, around that kind of stuff. And if they don't have it at the city level, they certainly would at the county level because they also have uh, the ability to respond to mental health crises, you know, as we learned, you know, from Meredith's presentation last month. So. You know, there's data that's out there. It would be interesting to know what is that data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, that that would be, you know, some people like anecdotal evidence. They, you know, they especially with mass shooters or things like that. That's always the question is, oh, this person had a mental health mm -hmm. problem or whatever. But, you know, I would certainly find it interesting to see, OK, it, you know, what percentage of these calls would be better off? Mm -hmm. being responded to by a, a mental health pr professional or some sort of crisis team be because right. then you know then you have real data you can say okay you know we're a third of our calls we're sending and you know an armed officer out there when what we really need is someone to to talk them down and mm -hmm. uh, understand their situation and it triage the mental health crisis mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just I'm trying to like take madly take some notes here. You know, and so that's that, you know, to potential that point, actions. Yeah. What is our role in how do we get that information and how do we get it out to the public? Do we have do, does our board have a role in that? Right. I, I think we do. I mean, mm -hmm. just to put a short answer to your question, yeah. I absolutely <laughs> think we do. You know, I mean, it's it has to, yeah, you know, our role, of course, is to, you know, advise the city council and the health department. So, mm -hmm. you know, because we kind of sit in between those two bodies, you know, we can, you know, go to both of those entities with either advice, recommendation, uh, requests, you know, so... So that's helpful as well, you know, is to be able to request things, you know, so, 
have some sort of data review around, you know, policing, have some, uh, you know, and I think of it as, you know, for mental health as well, is that we probably would have to narrow the scope around mental health data because really the Minneapolis Health Department has uh, mental health providers in the schools, so in the school-based clinics. So there's your youth uh, component, you know, is what is what does that data look like, you know, in terms of providing mental health services to youth in schools. Um, but, you know, Meredith, as a part of this committee, has, you know, resources into, you know, Hennepin County, you know, to be able to answer some of those questions. So it is really tapping into the, um, yeah, the professional and kind of, you know, key contacts, you know, that the the members themselves have, as well as then, you know, that those roles of advising and recommending you know, to the city council and the health department. Um, and that takes on a lot. You know, that takes on a lot of options. Hi, Sharon, we're glad you joined us. Yes, I had to actually restart. Oh. <laughs> Complete, I had to completely re, uh, um, update and restart oh, everything. So I apologize. No worries. We're glad that you joined us. We can kind of give you a quick little recap here of, you know, what we've been talking about, which were really um, two big areas within this priority is um, mental health. Um, and that, of course, takes on all kinds of layers, you know, in terms of cultural competence of the, you know, provider, the lack of access to, you know, folks that are uh, either, um, you know, providers of color, culture, language, um, you know, that would match, you know, the person seeking the services. So just the lack of access and the lack, sheer lack of numbers, you know, for, for people. Um, we talked about, um, also, uh, you know, just that mental health as a priority is just a high priority, both in the city, in the county. I talked about a couple of collaborations that the Minneapolis Health Department is part of. So there's a seven county wide collaboration that, you know, has a collective action committee on mental health. Um, and Terri Ann was able to share from her professional experience that, um, uh, you know, mental health at the state level is so narrowly defined as a provider. If you're a mental health provider, it's so narrowly defined. And how how is it that that could be, that definition could really be kind of cracked open, you know, or, or a, a different kind of legislation passed that creates greater access. Um, and then we also talked about other things that uh, PHAC, so what what would a PHAC role be, you know, in terms of either helping to dispel myths, reduce stigma, you know, share resources, um, you know, learn more about mental health uh, initiatives that are going on, you know, both in the city and, and in the county, especially since those would be the two places that we would have and immediate touch points. Um, and we also talked about, you know, how do you work to increase like community member response, you know, to a person that is experiencing a mental health, um, you know, incident, whatever that incident is. So sort of the take the CPR and the AED training model and, you um, you know, and really try to increase that community capacity so that any person on the street, you know, has some tools in their toolbox that could be a, um, a help, 
you know, in a situation that it, they wouldn't be a provider, they would not maybe not even be able to refer that person to resources. But, you know, if you could actually bring that person sort of back from the edge or wait until help arrives, um, you know, that that it could be, a, a you know, like a game changer, you know, just at a community level. And then we talked about public safety. Um, and so we were talking about the intersection between public safety and mental health, um, talking about, again, like what are what is the role that PHAC could play? Um, you know, what would it actually look like to have uh, sort of the current police officer void that Minneapolis is experiencing and have it filled with social workers? you know, or other, uh, you know, respondents who could go out on calls and um, and then we started down the data path, you know, like, well, how many mental health calls are there that come in? Um, how are those responded to? Um, uh, you know, who, has anybody put together a budget, you know, related to what would what would a changed you know, like Department of Public Safety look like and how, you know, what would that cost? And we were coming up with some ideas of who might have that information. So there's the three minute elevator speech of what we just talked about. <laughs> Thank you. Sharon, do you have any any thoughts on on any of that stuff that Margaret just shared or? Oh, uh, well, I just give you a, a, just a little bit about my background. I retired from Hennepin County Medical Center mm -hmm. um, May 1st, and I worked there uh, slightly over 20 years uh, as a psychiatric uh, nurse and the last six years in the emergency room with the acute psychiatric service area. And then I also worked another four at the at the adult detention center downtown. And so I'm very familiar with what you're speaking of and uh, have worked, I, I guess, as a pay, paid person <laughs> since 82 off and on in the area of, uh, of uh, mental health. And um, so and I did look over your slides from the last of the last presentation, and I noticed that none of the uh, hospitals that actually have psychiatric beds uh, were included in the presentation, which I was surprised uh, because the the uh, the you know the the staff at the uh, hospital in the emergency rooms um, have. Uh, a lot of content it's probably as much contact as the police do mm -hmm. individuals with mental health crisis and um, so that's why i wanted to get on your included in your discussion yeah thank you for that uh the reason that they that those slides didn't include any hospital information is because it was a presentation so meredith martinez is a phac member she's the hennepin county representative to this committee and so she had um made an offer a couple of months ago as the PHAC was talking about these priorities, you know, and, and um, what's going to rise to the top. She had made an offer to come and share a presentation um, from the county, so from Hennepin County specifically, um, that they had done to the county board. Um, and so it was she and one of her um, co-workers or one of her colleagues from, uh, you know, as human services, yeah, Hennepin County Human Services. So, so that's the only reason that it didn't include hospital is because it was um, specific to what the public health and human services had presented to the Hennepin County Board. But I think that's like such a great gap right that you've just identified in our own learning is um, both in terms of public safety which is you know another one of the buckets within this group and uh, mental health is 
um, you know, how that lands in the hospitals, you know, how it lands in community clinics, how, um, you know, how are those responses? What does that data look like? And then, you know, what what are the demographics, you know, around, um, you know, those mental health uh, and, and demographics isn't quite the right word. I mean, I mean more in terms of um, uh, Terry Ann was sharing about, yeah, there like a sheer lack of mental health beds, you know, like acute mental health care within, yeah. you know, uh, the city of Minneapolis and, you know, knowing somebody who had to go seven hours away, you know, to even get uh, get a bed, you know, in a facility where she, you know, she would be safe. So, yeah, so that's, um, it, it, you've really pointed out something kind of critical in terms of a piece of the pie that we haven't really heard anything about. Yeah, and I, I'm surprised because um, Hennepin, the Hennepin County Medical Center where I worked, mm -hmm. we uh, have, uh, you know, such close contact with the county commissioners because they help with our funding. Mm -hmm. And like at the acute um because like you all were talking about, there's, of course, there's not enough, there's not enough psychiatrists, there's not enough psychiatric nurse practitioners, there's not enough registered nurses, mental health workers, there's just, uh, for adults, it's even worse for children, and uh, like at uh, Hennepin County Medical Center, there's only 14 beds in the acute psychiatric service area for individuals to wait, and so it uh, and then, of course, uh, the jails of uh, issues, is, uh, you know, individuals end up in, uh, you know, at the Hennepin County Adult Detention Center. And I'm sure with children, I just work with adults. So I but I but children did end up in mm -hmm. our area because there weren't places. And so I think mm -hmm. uh, something that always concerned me um, uh, is that there's just not good information for the public to know where to send their family members. Uh, Cause like Hennepin County Medical Center, for example, only has outpatient services for children. So it would, uh, you know, and oftentimes people just bring people just wherever instead of sending people to places that actually have services so children aren't um, who are in crisis with adults that are in crisis. Uh, just things like that would be, I would say, would be helpful. So if the public actually knew where the facilities that could service children, so if their child actually needed to go inpatient, they could just be there instead of having to wait literally hundreds, sometimes hundreds of hours mm -hmm. to go to a place that um, could take care of children. And then also too, if people had chemical dependency needs for inpatient, where to go instead of just bringing them just anywhere so that people, you know, it's just not good. Uh, Sharon, I have a question. This is Terri Ann. Um, sure. So, because uh, I, I know a lot of OTs that work in inpatient mental health at HCMC, and I know that those number of beds have shrunk over the years, I believe. Yes, the I, inpatient beds have gone down because they don't have enough psychiatrists. <laughs> right, right, right. And then uh, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying, and I just think, you know, that's part of the issue, right? We Anything that's not crisis related is always at risk of funding or it's grant funded, right? And it, yeah, it does great work, but okay, the grant's done, <laughs> you know, time to move on. And I don't think, we, I mean, I think I, you know, I just think about driving around the Twin Cities now and how many billboards are you seeing for urgent orthopedic care everywhere? Seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., you, you know, snap your finger or your wrist or your foot, boom, go to wherever. There's like Tria and there's a couple other places. But you're right, we don't have that at all for mental health across the lifespan, whether it's kids or adults. And people go one or two routes, right? I go to the emergency room, I call the police. <laughs> like, what do I do, you know? And neither wow. one are good options. 
sometimes. I I think I think both of what what you know what I'm hearing both of you say is uh, you, you know well two things like one people need to know more uh, uh, have better information on where to take people but then also just on a broad societal scale how much of an issue is this really because it, it, you know it's as we know it's big but the average person's um, you know thinking about mental health is again I mean it's Oh, there was a mass shooting. Uh, was the person mentally ill? Why didn't they take his guns? When really the damage, and, be, and because it's sensational, and uh, you know, but really the the damage is in the day to day interactions, and um, you know, the, the everyday stuff far outweighs the you know the mass shootings that we unfortunately have in in the United States. I'm not saying they're. I'm not trying to minimize them in any way. But, um, you know, they, people just don't understand how big of a problem it actually is. Because it gets so watered down, right? And I don't mean watered down as in dissipated, but, you know, if I have a child that I'm that is hovering on the edge of mental health crisis, I just got to try to get him to school the next day, right? And then maybe that kid pulls it together a little bit with the structure of school, but it's still a problematic situation, right? It's, right. it's uh, now we have a kid who's either inflicting trauma on other kids <laughs> is experiencing their own trauma is giving the teacher trauma like i think it i think the acute need of what's going on often gets diffused until someone really absolutely tips over into the acute medical system for for psychiatry and the, that is correct and unfortunately sometimes people have to come back multiple times because Either the family or the patient themselves aren't able to actually communicate and they have a very strict criteria of what they use to intervene to actually keep a person in an inpatient setting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with law, of course, laws that have been passed to make sure that people have their rights. Because um, I people would ask me a lot of times, well, that person should never have left. They need to. But unfortunately, it's subjective and it's up to the individuals who are communicating to the provider um, what exactly is going on. And so that's that's also what makes it so difficult. Um, mm hmm. Well, and the other thing I was going to say about your observation, Terry Ann, about, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't not see, you know, all of the billboards that are related to, you know, orthopedic care and urgent care of, you know, one kind or another is that it's like, you got to follow the money. Yeah. You know, those services are reimbursable at a rate Absolutely. that obviously makes it worth the time to open up a brand new facility that has the doctors available. And when you don't have that same kind of um, outlook on mental health and mental health provision and training mental health protection practitioners and passing laws that broaden those descriptions of who can and cannot do this work, you know, you have just created, you know, a funnel that is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a time bomb, you know, kind of waiting to go off. And it, I think that that's really what we have been experiencing is just the increasing narrowing, you know, of that funnel to the point where, you know, the whole system is stuck. And isn't, I think I read the statistic a couple of years ago, but in Minnesota, the large, you know, the, the biggest payment source for mental health services is medical assistance. Well, you know, that's at the mercy of federal funding and state decisions. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, very complex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we're going to get yanked back here any second. What a robust conversation. I'm so glad that we had just comfortable time to be able to, you know, really dump out a lot of um, both ideas as well as, um, yeah, just concerns, you know, and experiences of, you know, what the what the mental health and public safety, you know, situations are like here. So. I guess I will just say thanks to all of you <laughs> for all of that.
Yeah, that was the most fun thing I did all day. I mean, it's a it's a difficult issue, but um, it's you know, I it's like I like talking about this stuff. So um, it was nice to hear perspectives from Tyrion and Sharon and Margaret, and mm-hmm. ho- hopefully the rest of the committee agrees. <laughs> Thank you for taking notes, Margaret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure how complete they are, but there's at least something there. <laughs> <laughs> They're good, I'm sure. We'll see. Well, um, I, I keep expecting that we're just going to like disappear here any moment. So I'm going to run um, and get a snack. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. So, that sounds great. J- and Jerome is so punctual. He'll give us like 30 seconds at most. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think here we go. I think we're disappearing as we speak. Oh, I wonder if I need to stop recording. Maybe so.